So if I unmute, okay. New audio on there, and then hopefully this is working. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So I don't think I have a full thirty or fifty minutes. Let's see how many questions. Uh, yeah. You get out early, they get out early. It just means you didn't have much air. I hope you don't lose. Oh, I haven't seen. Yeah. Coming across. I got a buffer. Yeah. 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 I don't think it's on the agenda because I looked on there as well. Yeah, it's in the email to all the coaches too. I think I can just pull up the meeting ID on here. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> I'm I'm sure it's fine. I mean I guess I could give you yeah, it, just, you just risk. I mean you can go ahead and start. Yeah, that's fair. You don't you don't need to meet it, but is that it for me? I think it should be fine. I just muted it on this system, so it should be all right. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. We're a few minutes late. As per usual, we had some technical difficulties this morning. You can always expect that with Zoom. Um so welcome to the Science Olympiad Coaches Workshop. Um, this is the first, obviously, little workshop we're doing. This is on Can't Judge a Powder. Um, so last year, I guess, was my first year actually being an event supervisor for the Science Olympiad. It was really fun, really enjoyed it. Uh, that being said, I'm sure you guys have more experience than I do as far as actually you know, coaching these students and working with them directly. Um, so this is just kind of what I took away from my first experience with this event. And if I am around in Knoxville for the next Science Olympiad, I will probably also be doing this event then too. So it may be advice for the future, maybe not. Uh, my name is Alexandria. Well, I guess we'll, first we'll talk about what we're going over. Maybe we'll just click through. So first I'm gonna talk about myself um, and why I am sort of the event supervisor for Can't Judge a Powder. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction and description of the actual event, uh, then give some tips for how to approach the experiment or how to coach your students to approach the experiment, uh, give some tips on lab note taking so that it makes it easier for your graders. And let's see, let me turn down the volume on my phone so I'm not interacting with myself. Um, yeah, so it makes it easier for the graders and your students get all the points that they deserve based on the work that they've done. Um, how to coach your students to approach the actual exam portion based on both the exam I wrote and then practice exams from other events. And then also hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions and comments from you. I'm not sure if I had a full 50 minutes here. Um, so hopefully we'll have time at the end. I know we got started a little bit late, but that's okay. And um, we're not gonna do a ton of hands-on and feel free if somebody wants to grab this extra chair. We're not gonna do a ton of hands-on stuff. I mostly just have all this in the front to give a visual of what to bring and then what we provide et cetera, et cetera. And I have some conductivity meters as well up there. And then I tried to put a couple little cartoons in here just to keep things fun. This one makes me laugh every time. So um, I think that's it for the overview. So I keep trying to do that with the mouse. So my name is Alex, uh, Alex Bone, like a bone in your body. I'm a grad student at UT. I have been a grad student at UT for five and a half years. 
Um, hopefully we won't round out the sixth year. Uh, we'll see what happens. Ideally, I'm defending this winter. Um, so in my time at UT, I've been a teacher for several years. I have done research as a research assistant. Um, and I'm also, well, I was responsible. I'm not anymore for a couple of departmental instruments. So I maintain and train students on those. Um, so lots of teaching experience. I'm an inorganic chemist by trade, um, which means can judge a powder is kind of my bread and butter as far as the, the kind of chemistry I've been trained on as a graduate student. Uh, my advisor is Zeeling Shu. If you're ever interested, this is him on the left. This is our candid group picture. Um, he's really sweet, which is not super common for a PhD advisor. So really lucky in that, that regard. Uh, more specifically, I work on essentially making and studying single molecule magnets or quantum bits. Um, and see, it's some sort of a molecular uh, compound or several molecular compounds where I see how local vibrational modes sort of affect how they store data. Um, so that's sort of my research in organic chemists by trade. I feel like after five and a half years of grad school, hopefully I have enough experience to write an exam for middle schoolers. Um, as far as working with as far as working with students that are younger than college students, um, I've done several events with CAPS outreach and several mentorship opportunities for high school and middle school students. Um, one of my favorites was the through CAPS and through the Math and Science Center at UTK. I posted for two summers, um, a handful of high school students where they come to campus, they do research projects on their own that are sort of, you know, molded by us. And then they do presentations and write papers on them at the end of the summer. That's a really cool residential program where they could kind of stay on campus um, to suggest to your middle schoolers if they're interested in that as they get into high school. I've also helped organize and run the UTK forensic camp for middle school students. That happens every summer. Um, I think it's fairly cheap to enroll. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool. They do a lot of hands-on sort of forensic experiments. They extract DNA from strawberries. Um, they look at, you know, things like luminol, stuff like that. It's very, very cool camp um, for your middle school students. I'm assuming everybody is a teacher at middle school, high school level-ish, or roughly can be described as, <laughs> as a teacher. Okay. Yeah. So all of your, um, your, I guess, com competitors, competitors, What's, what's the, your team, your team, we're talking about the kids, like your, not students, but like competitors. Okay. Yeah. That might be an interesting experience for them, your team that they will, uh, that they would enjoy. So that's me. Um, it's nice to meet you guys. I'm happy to be here. I think we may have ended up needing one more. And so just a general introduction to the Can't Judge a Powder event. Um, I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with it. It's very heavily standardized across different states. Um, essentially, the students are provided with some amount of an unknown substance. It should be equal among all teams and several different reagents, a couple of which are defined in the actual instructions that are included on the Science Olympiads website, and then some that are up to the event supervisor's discretion. Um, and a certain amount of time allotted, so the entire exam is around 50 minutes. It depends on... A lot of this is up to how the event supervisor sort of designs this event. If they want to do a more difficult exam, then they'll probably give them maybe 25 minutes and then 25 minutes versus an easier exam with fewer questions, easier, you know, in quotes, with fewer questions might be 35 minutes for experiment, 15 minutes for the exam. So that's up to the instructor or the supervisor's discretion. Um, and so within that first time block, your students are tasked with taking as many observations as possible. And observations is a really important word there because that's, I think that's where a lot of the point breakdown um, comes into play as far as grading goes. So they're given their substance, some reagents, and then whatever they have brought with them. And they have a certain amount of time to just write down as many observations as they can about the substance that they've given, they've been given. And so for the exam part, uh, we have several exam questions. Some of them are very specific. Some of them are more open-ended. Um, <laughs> for the recording, I won't talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not muted on here. I just gotta check, make sure I'm not muted when I do this. Um, so for the exam, they answer the questions by directly referring to the observations that they recorded during the exper experimental section. So that I think was, the organizational part is actually more challenging than the act, doing the lab part um, for the students in general from what I saw. Um, they are not expected to identify this substance. They're not expected to have any prior knowledge of this substance. Uh, for this past year, I used baking soda 
I would assume that a lot of middle school students, maybe, I don't know, um, are familiar with baking soda. You know, they might know what it looks like already, might know what it smells like. Some of them maybe could look at it from their chemistry or kitchen experience and say, oh, I know this is baking soda. But that's not the point of the of the actual exam. Um, and that's not the point of their experimental part. So they're not trying to really identify what it is as much as take observations on it. Yes. So if you decide to provide them with a reagent that isn't on their rules, mm -hmm. you will tell them yes. what it is. And okay, I'm yeah, sure. yeah, no, with a, with a good event supervisor, um, yes. If they're given a, like an additional reagent aside from what's specifically listed, uh, hopefully, yeah, your event supervisor would at least tell them what it is and then give them general instructions for using it, especially, you know, safety oriented. Um, if it's not listed, I don't know the truth. Yeah. Know the training of, I'm not going to use it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I think these are mostly, I, they're, there is a lot of similarities, except for the online. The online portion is a little bit different because I'm not sure how they set up those modules. It seemed like the students had more sort of numerical information with those. Um, so for all the practice tests that are for in-person exams, they're pretty standard across all of them. Never really seen anybody throw in something crazy um, as far as extra reagents. But I mean, I can't think of any yeah, anything that would be appropriate for middle schoolers that you could just kind of toss in there. They might give you, I mean, just to maybe confuse them, in addition to sodium hydroxide, they may give really dilute potassium hydroxide to something else that's a base and see, you know, if students are inclined to use that. Oh, no. Yeah. That's I okay mean, because it will confuse college students too. Yeah. <laughs> in the lab and I have to swap out some potassium iodide for sodium iodide and like, Oh no, this is not I'm like it's okay, guys. We don't <laughs> yeah. iodine, we don't care about the cation. But yeah. so it's, it might do that. Yeah. So at the middle school level, I wouldn't expect any crazy curveballs as far as extra reagents. Yes. Yeah. Oops, sorry, but are students allowed to have their notes uh, that they the observations that they make during that seven period of the exam? Yes, yeah. So that's exactly the yeah. I'll go over that here in a second. Um, I think that's all. On the, so this is just a basic overview. So this is what we provide. Um, one molar sodium hydroxide, those volumes aren't specified. One molar hydrochloric acid, um, so an acid and a base. Um, neither volume of those is specified. I don't know why. Waste containers, so essentially large beakers. They may be broken up into acid and base waste, but since these are so dilute, maybe. Um, a wash bottle with less than or equal to 250 mils of distilled water. I'm not sure why they specify. That's a specified volume. I'm not sure why. Maybe so they don't dilute things too much. I don't know if they add the acid in the water. Who knows? Um, pens and or pencils. So during the exam, they'll have a different pen or pencil color than they had during the actual experimental part. So that way, if they forgot to do an, an observation during the experimental part, they can't go during the exam and pretend that they actually did make that observation and then reference that on the exam. So the exam and the, um, the experiment are broken up by a sort of pen or pencil color. Um, and then other supervisor specific equipment, such as hot plates, microscopes, et cetera, um, just based on the exam that the supervisor has written. So we actually did our lab or our experiment in one of these labs. I don't know if it was this room. I think it might've been that room. But, you know, we have hot plates in here just for our undergrads. Um, and in my case, I specified that they would not need to use the hot plate. They would not need to use any of the probes that were in front of them um, for the actual exam portion or to actually, you know, sufficiently answer the questions on the exam. I would hope that other event supervisors would also do that, specify whether or not the hot plates are available to use. And then because they're middle schoolers as well, teach them specifically how to use the hot plate. Um, so that's allowed for event supervisors to provide. Um, and then what you guys should bring, there is a list and I can pull up that website um, at the end of this presentation. There's a list on the Can't Judge a Powder specific page on the Olympiad site that has all of, I think it includes a few different events. It has all of the recommended stuff that you should bring. Um, this is what I pulled from that list for Can't Judge a Powder. And then everything in orange is stuff that they absolutely will need. Um, stuff like glassware, you know, beakers so that they can actually pour our liquids into separate containers. Um, you don't, I mean, I think on that list, it has beakers, graduated cylinders, Erlenmeyers. I'm not sure what they will need for other events. Yeah, for this event in particular, they probably don't need Erlenmeyers and beakers, 
you know, it's like just some sort of glass vessel. Um, they typically, I haven't seen any where they've had to measure volumes. So burettes, um, you know, volumetric pipettes, graduated cylinders, they don't really need stuff like that. Just glass vessels, maybe stir rods for solubility. Um, petri dishes are also suggested. If you do use petri dishes, I would suggest maybe glass ones. These are all aqueous, so plastic won't, you know, fall apart, but still, um, if you're buying them anyway. Uh, spot plates. I've, I've not seen an exam yet that has anything to do with spot plates, but it is on the list, so I figured I'd include it. Um, any droppers. I included my acid and base in dropper bottles. I don't know if that will be. I think it's specified on the event supervisor instructions to do them in dropper bottles, but that doesn't guarantee that they will be. Um, spatulas are important. Any tongs or forceps, not necessarily for this one, just because it's a powder. Um, stir rods. Thermometers are really important. Um, pH paper, I would definitely recommend that. You can also bring pH probes. I know that Texas Instruments has, you know, a graphing calculator that has different probes that you can put in there for temperature and conductivity and pH. Um, it's not really necessary. You can do all that with the, you know, sort of bog standard lab equipment that we use <laughs> in general. Um, so pH paper, magnifying glass, that is something that I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily think of, but is often yeah alluded to yeah on the exam conductivity meters are really important I actually provided them for my students just in case because I had several questions on the exam that related to conductivity but you know that's something that make sure they have them test them before the actual event because ours like half the time don't work um, and to make sure they know how to use them I, I've never given them a meter they always have a battery attached to an LED yeah um, so that works just that works just as well. That's yeah. It may be better just so that they understand what's actually happening. Cause I think this is, I mean, figuratively and literally sort of a black box for some of our students. Um they don't really exactly know what they're measuring. They just see the light and say yes. Um so ruler, eh, magnets, eh. Paper towels. Hopefully you should have paper towels, but just in case, you know, I don't know. And then any PPE that they need, that's something that we didn't provide. So you know, I brought a lab coat. These goggles to me as an event supervisor are sufficient. I don't know about other event supervisors. You may need the ones that are that have the, you know, the, technically the rules say that they those have ones, to be the side indirectly shield. vented splash, splash okay. goggles. All right. So whatever goggles are, yeah. you know, they look like the ones that leave marks on your face. Yeah. And then gloves that fit them. That's the only I you know, I would have brought gloves, but I don't know. I said five that their skin has to be covered. So yeah. Um, I need one sort of usually one to the teacher. That's a good idea. Because I can't afford lab coats. Yeah, so that, yeah, they don't need. So I give them one to the teacher. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's perfectly sufficient. And not to mention, none of these reagents should be, you know, catastrophically dangerous. Yeah. And I need hot plates because they suck at testing. And I've got kind of broken testing with middle school. Yeah. So um, I use the spot plates a lot. Okay. We can't judge powder because you know you can put your few crystals there and put your drops back and you just yeah. Use it to that. Yeah, that's a great um, idea. And it, it's it's a good way to observe what happens because if they're happy to pick up it, it's a uh, to Yeah. Really yeah. I use spot plates because they're cheaper. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they have yeah, I do pack them with tissue paper if they die, but I still get all my stuff in front. Yeah, and most awesome. everything, most everything in this event should be aqueous. I don't think they give you anything in an organic solvent that would cause you know the plastic to break down. So that but should it, be fine. I mean, there's a lot of tests, and most kids run out of time if they do every test they possibly can. Yeah, and um, it, unless they're really, really good and very well practiced, and you might have a lot. So um, I don't have a lab. So okay. everything's done on my, you know, twice a block my papers at school. And so, and, and I don't do it very much. So yeah. my kids aren't as, every time I teach them, I don't know what they're talking about. But, um, yeah. But like I said, in middle school, sometimes yeah. I worry about the glass stuff. I, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I could, I worry about it with our college students. So I can only imagine, you know, I had, when I taught the high schoolers this past summer, I had one student who would not stop touching the desktop with his bare hands and then licking his fingers. I was like, Levi, oh, stop, 
It's like, I'm serious. That's actually really dangerous. Like, I know you don't know, but stop. <laughs> ah, like I'm just a grad student. Okay. So yeah, be resourceful Um, just based on what resources you have. Yeah. I remember seeing something in the rules about if you're bringing stuff for like multiple chemistry events to have separate kits, because not all the stuff in one chemistry based event is going to be allowable in the other one. Yeah. So, you know, I, do. I, have, I have a separate candidate powder and fire kits. Cool. So, cool. It's really the conductivity meter, I think, is the excluded thing from fire busters. Yeah. There's only a couple things. Yeah. That, I can't remember what the yeah. artist is. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait, somebody. And then there's some biology related things that don't show up on here. Um, but I think there's only two items that are on the list that aren't for can't judge a powder. Let's see. Okay, so this is more about how to coach your students for how to approach the actual experiment. I was actually, you know, very impressed. I, I wasn't sure what to expect um, whenever I went into this event because I've mostly done grading for the Science Olympiad in the past, but I was really impressed with how the students did this time. And they all seem to be pretty calm. They all seem to have a plan. So this is just, you know, what I would what I would do given that, you know, one event's experience if I had a team that I was coaching. Um, so their primary goal is to record as many observations as possible. Um, and they all have to be recorded. I've seen in some practice exams where some kind supervisors will give them two to three minutes between the exam and the experiment to write down anything that they forgot to write down or that they can remember that they didn't write down. If they didn't specifically say, you know, powder is white and they remember that after the, you know, after the ex experimental period is over, some supervisors will give them a sort of a buffer. Um, not all do. So make sure that they write down as much as possible. And then one important thing, I think the most important thing with this event and maybe um, the most difficult for them to actually conceptualize is the difference between observations versus inferences. And I think that students tend to go for inferences because that's how they answer most questions in a classroom setting, because that's what classrooms are for. You know, you take what you've known before and what you're learning now and try to put the context together and give an inference. <laughs> But this event is about observations where the information, everything they write down in their notebook should be something that can be gathered via the five senses. Um, it can be qualitative, such as, you know, the color or quantitative, um, where you're actually measuring what you observe, like a temperature change or a change in pH. Um, whereas an inference is an explanation for an observation based on your previous experience. So what we want to see in both the notebook portion and on the exam questions, um, how they answer them are observations as opposed to inferences. Um, observations will always get you full points. Inferences won't necessarily. And that was something difficult for me when I was approaching this event to sort of conceptualize um, and think about how I was going to break this. So one example of this is, uh, say they do an experiment where they take a small amount of their powder and they add it to 10 milliliters or so of hydrochloric acid. An observation for that, and so I'm just using baking soda as my example, an observation for that would be a gas formed when it was added to hydrochloric. Uh, whereas an inference would be that the substance is basic. So if the students write in their notebook, the substance is basic, you know, I that is correct, but I can't necessarily do anything with that entry. So they've kind of wasted their time writing it down when I, they clearly know, you know, they, they know that it bubbled and that it formed a gas, but they made an inference instead of actually just recording their observation. So it's kind of asking them take, to take a step back from what they maybe typically do in a science classroom setting as opposed to a lab. Um, and that's where a lot of the point differentials came into play when it came to grading is what was an observation versus what was an inference. So a couple of different things for, you know, if you do have a lot of time to prepare for this, I know there's a ton of events in the Olympiad. Um, so you obviously can't focus just on my, my little event. Um, but if you do have time to help sort of prep them, even in the 10 minutes before you guys actually come into the event room, uh, have a game plan. Definitely emphasize efficiency as far as how they go about doing their tests, as well as proper labeling for their actual experimental um, portion and their observation sheets. Um, assign jobs to students. So how you do that is up to you and based on, you know, what kind of students you have. Obviously, you know them better than, than I do. Um, familiarize students with common exam questions. There are practice exams with keys uh, written by event supervisors on the Can't Judge a Powder specific Olympiad website. You'll notice a ton of commonalities among those exams, even from year to year. 
I, like I looked at the ones for this past Olympiad and they were very similar to the ones from the year before. There are some questions that will show up on every single one just because, you know, scientists tend to, you know, we pick things, we like them, and then we use them over and over again. Um, just so they kind of know what to prepare for. Cause I think that was, that comes into a lot of it is just that anxiety that they get not knowing what's going to happen when they get the exam. Um, and then maybe if you have time and they're specifically motivated, try to create flow charts for how they're going to go about their experiment. Um, say, you know, say they're given these things, you know, you could do a flow chart of take three beakers, fill one with water, one with hydrochloric, one with uh, sodium hydroxide, do temperature and conductivity measurements on all three, add the powder to all three, you know, stuff like that, where they can sort of visualize what steps to go through in this experimental portion. And also delegate tasks, uh, make sure that the students know what their role is. If you have one, I know middle schoolers aren't, they don't necessarily have the neatest handwriting. If you have one that's just absolutely heinous and you can't read anything they write, you know, maybe assign them to do most of the experiments. Because um, if I can't read it, I can't grade it. Yeah, you have a question? I'm going to ask, because um, I'm going to see if this is like, do you have a finite amount of experiments you can do? Or with like the record as many algorithms as possible, are you just going after like everything? You're going after everything. Okay. I mean, I guess there is probably like some number out there that's like is a limit for how many they can do, but they're trying to do as many as possible. Okay. So you can just bring in all kinds of stuff. All yeah, I don't think stuff. I don't think they can bring in reagents, but okay. it wouldn't that wouldn't be relevant anyway because you know, like a, a supervisor isn't going to have a question on an exam that needs a reagent that they don't give you. So yeah, I mean they can do as many tests as they can conceive with what we've given them and also um, the stuff that you bring that's on that glassware list. I have a question. Yes. So if I have pH paper uh -huh. and I've got say a basic substance mm -hmm. and I make a recording, I make an observation that my substance turns my blue pH paper red. Yes. And my red pH paper no change. Is that one observation or two? So you're oh, using sorry, two different paper. types of pH paper. Litmus paper. Sorry, yeah, you're... Litmus paper. Do they have pH paper or litmus paper? I think they have pH they paper. Okay. Yeah. Either. Okay. So if I had litmus paper, would that be two observations or one? Okay. Does a null observation count, in other words? I think if you put them on two separate lines. Yeah, I think that's really it. Like, if you label them separately, then yes. Otherwise, you could just do, you know, A and then have that. As a, because I think as a student, double. I'd be tempted, like, oh, I made my observation. It turned my blue red. I'm done. Yeah. Right. As opposed to going for the negative control, which getting controls for our regular students is also. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah, it just really depends on how they choose to break it up. I don't know if I would necessarily penalize them if there wasn't, if they didn't include a negative control. But, you know, I try to keep my expectations reasonable um, as far as this event. Yeah. And so another way that I saw a lot of students doing it is that they were both taking notes and performing experiments simultaneously. Um, the only issue with that that I can see, it might be more efficient, but, you know, they they need to know kind of what each one is going to do before they go into the, the actual experimental part. You don't want them having to sort of argue with each other about, well, you know, did you do it in a base? I already did that. You know, that can, that can kind of, they get panicky a little bit and that can kind of waste time um, for them. So as long as they know sort of what jobs they have in advance, um, that would also potentially work. And it also depends on your students, what they're best at, how well they work together, et cetera. So for lab note taking, um, this is just some, and most of them were really good. I think a lot of them based on the instructions that were written on the exam and then also what I gave them verbally, uh, they understood and they did very well in doing this. So this is just an overview of what I expect. Um, so establish a labeling scheme. Usually, you know, people who are grading can figure out what that scheme is as long as it's consistent. If it's one student taking notes, it can be one, two, three, A, B, C, whatever they feel most comfortable with. If it's two students, it gets a little more complicated. Um, you could do one doing letters, one doing numbers. You could do one doing like A1, A2, A3, one doing B1, B2, B3, just so I know which observation sheet I'm looking at whenever they go to answer that exam question. Make sure that they are clearly labeled. If nothing else, make sure that I know which observation is corresponding to what you're trying to sort of refer back to on your exam. Um, so if it's not observable, you have the five senses, you know, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, and it does not belong on the observation sheet. But I want to say, and also feel like UT would want me to say not to encourage your students to taste anything. Uh, I can't guarantee it'll be baking soda, 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so just observation. <laughs> yeah, please don't, please don't. But you know, I did teach that high schooler, so I do feel like I should say it. Um, I have an example just on the bottom of some phrases that I would expect to see in a lab notebook. It doesn't have to be complete sentences. I do not care about grammar. Nobody, no scientist really does, period. Um, but some examples would be, you know, they, they get the powder, they can write very small crystals that are white in color. So that's multiple observations that are in one sort of group. That's fine. Um, as long as they sort of indicate which one it is. Um, did not draw in moisture with exposure to air, you know, dissolved slash disappeared when mixed with water. Or they could write, you know, dissol like soluble in water, whatever. Um, that's kind of that fine line of inference versus observation that, you know. <laughs> that's why we got judges. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so hopefully, you know, I, I graded all of my exams so that I knew that it was consistent because of this issue with the observation versus inference. But, you know, some people with bigger groups or bigger events, you know, I don't know how many teams we'll have next year, will um, enlist helpers, undergrad, you know, volunteers, um, to grade. So yeah, make sure that it's consistent. I think you guys can look at that afterwards. Yeah, can review it. So make sure to do that. Just, you know, argue for points if you need to. Um, let's see. I think that's all. Yes. Okay. So how do teacher students to approach the exam? This is probably the most difficult part and what also gives them the most anxiety. Um, my exam, I think, was 12 questions. Most of them were pretty direct. Sometimes we get open-ended questions. I've seen a lot where they'll say, what do you think is your best observation? And I don't, I didn't include that on my exam. I'm pretty sure just because I didn't love that quite. I didn't feel like that was, I mean, it was kind of a gimme, but it's also, how do you answer that with an observation? Um, that's sort of a weird question to ask for this, I think. Anyway, you'll see it on a couple of the practice exams, but essentially, you know, the answer the question with an observation and directly indicate which observation corresponds to the answer. So I've given some, a question and then some sort of example answers here. Um, so if the question was, were there free ions present in the aqueous solution of an unknown substance or of the unknown substance? Um, ideally, you they would look back at their experimental observations. They would have one where they dissolved it in water and then used the conductivity meter. And they said either the light didn't light up or the light did light up on the conductivity meter in that solution. So they can answer the aqueous solution is conductive, observation A. There are free ions, the aqueous solution is conductive, observation A. Or there are free ions present, observation A. Me, as a grader, as an event supervisor, I would give all three of these answers um, full credit just because they have an observation. Um, and also they have, you know, both this conductivity and also the free ions. However, if there was a tiebreaker here, and that's kind of, we didn't have any ties this past event. But if there was a tiebreaker, then either of these answer one or answer two would get more points than answer three, uh, because this is more of an inference than including this observation that it is conductive. Um, so this one's kind of lacking an observation. And if it came down to tiebreaking or a very close score, you know, this one would get maybe four points, whereas these get five. Yes. What if they just said observation A? So... It, that's I think that can be like supervisor specific or grader specific. Um, in my opinion, if that observation said lit up conductive, that would be full credit for me just because, you know, they're saving time by not just writing out the answer. They know which observation answers the question. And then if they wrote like, yes, conductive or something on there, then that would be a full credit answer. I think we understood it one time. I don't know. Years that in this event has been around that long, um, that you can answer the question with which observation. Yeah, yeah, that would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of them did. I think most of them chose to do sentences, um, but yeah, they can't. They can just write observation A. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. Online test I've seen, they specify answer the question and list your observation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of them just say list which observation answers this question. Yeah. So as long as yeah. you specify what you're looking for. So yeah. Yeah. And it is kind of like how the event supervisor interprets those instructions and then 
et cetera. But if they have their observation on there, then it should be a full, and it's the right observation, just a caveat, um, then it should be full credit. Did you have a question? Uh, no. no, okay, sorry. And then these two bottom answers, um, answer four is the aqueous solution is conductive. That is the correct observation. That would get points, but it would maybe get three points instead of five because they didn't specifically indicate which observation it was. Um, and then there are free ions present. That is also a correct answer, but it would get fewer points because one, they don't include an observation. And also this is, an, this is more of an inference than it is uh, like a direct observation. So it is very sort of supervisor and event specific. Um, but as long as they're writing which observation corresponds to the answer and the observation that they're, re they're referring to is an actual observation and not an inference, <laughs> then they should get full credit for it. And you can argue for that. I think this is probably the most difficult sort of hurdle to jump over with actually coaching these students to do well in this this event. Yes. And this is also more of a question for you because I, I'm thinking conceptually about it and like how students would do their best is a proposition that they would be like come in and a set of like kind of almost like a pathway that they start with this experiment and they're going to go with this mm -hmm. and like experiments later. And of course, there's a lot of memorization, especially for middle school. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. What did you see? Not this one does not. Never mind. Not oh. the same with power. Yeah. So they kind of know. But what have you seen in the past um, in regards to the slides that come to the slide that people do the best? Like, or like what students have you seen do the best? Yeah. So it is, it's a little chaotic as a supervisor because you're making sure that everybody has everything they need and you're running around. Um, a lot of the students I noticed were, that were, it seemed to get, finished the quickest. That doesn't necessarily mean they did the best because I don't know which group is associated with which exam, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they tended to, both students were sort of, it was like parallel play. They were working independently, but together um, where it was one student doing experiments, the other student doing experiments, and then they were writing together. But it seemed like with those that they had done a fair amount of preparation. I didn't see a ton of, especially with how much time they took, I didn't see a huge disparity as far as the students who split up versus the students who came in and sort of talked through what they were gonna do as they were doing it. As long as they're familiar with common experiments that they should do. And what I would, like, I guess, suggest for that is if they have time and if you have time, have them look at a couple practice, practice exams and instead of answering the questions, have them think of what experiment they would do to answer that question. So if it says, you know, is it soluble in water? Have them think of, okay, well, I'd have to pour water into a beaker, dissolve my, powder in it like is it conductive sort of how would they go about answering that question and then hopefully they can pick out commonalities from one practice exam to the next because they they do they all are pretty similar if you have a chance to look at them on the website um, and then mine reflected those those pretty closely as well and they want to go to rogue yeah and then yeah and do have a sort of a specific game plan you know there's some things that they should do every time they should try and dissolve it in all of their reagents they should take conductivity in all of their reagents, do temperature in all of their reagents uh, before and after they add the powder. You know, there are some things that, and who knows how much of this they'll remember when they're all, you know, amped up. This one was at the end of the day this past uh, time. So I think a lot of them were also kind of tired, you know, burnt out, maybe stressed about something that happened earlier in the day or elated about something that happened earlier in the day. You never know. Uh, but they were ready to be done by the time they were done. But we didn't have any, I didn't have any issues with exam time. Uh, I think everybody finished with at least a couple minutes left. I didn't have to cut anybody off. So they all had time to properly answer and then go back and clarify if they needed to. Can you just repeat that thing you said really quickly where you said they all should, you recommend all the teams should dissolve and something about temperature before and after. And yeah. After. Can you repeat that? So essentially with how all of these have been written so far based on what I can tell, the first thing I would tell them to do is either with test tubes or a spot plate or beakers, you know, measure out some of each reagent. So the base, the acid and the water, um, take the temperature and the conductivity of just those reagents, like without the actual unknown substance, um, take a small amount and just sort of coach them on what a small amount is, maybe like a fingernail tip amount, not like 
you know, I gave them two grams, which is a lot, um, small amount, try to dissolve it in all three and then take the temperature of that as you dissolve it, make sure to record that temperature and then, um, conductivity as well. And so, and it's, you know, if you have pH paper, take the pH of all three before and after, um, that's mostly, that covers most of it and make sure they remember to write down things about how it looks, if it, if it has an odor, um, if it's crystalline or like, you know, look at it under the magnifying glass and write down what you see. There are certain things that sort of show up on every single one. And hopefully if they've seen them at least a couple times or at least seen the exams, they'll know sort of what, what experiments to do. I mean, I, yeah, if you have time and you have the means and the resources, then definitely run through it with them a couple times with an unknown substance. Uh, but like I said, you know, there are tons of events. Obviously, this isn't the only one. You have to kind of spread yourself fairly thin to prepare them. Um, let's see. What else do I have? So, yeah, these are some miscellaneous considerations, which is kind of what I was just talking about. Um, conductivity shows up in almost every single one I've ever seen, and it's almost always a free ion question. So, like it says, are there free ions in this solution? Um, so just make sure that, one, they know what that means, uh, what it means if you know, something conducts electricity, what is a free ion, um, so that they, they're they sort of prepared to answer that, because almost every single one has had it. Uh, like I said, remind students to perform tests on reagents before the unknown substance is added, like the temperature, conductivity, pH, etc. cetera. Uh, make sure you review, com review common chemistry lab terms with them, because a, a lot of these terms are used on the exam, and they can't really answer whether or not something is hygroscopic if they don't know what hygroscopic means. Um, Speaking of hygroscopic, if it's another note, just things that they should do, they should also take a little bit of the powder and just leave it out on the bench top without any solution, just to see if it does absorb liquid from the air or not. I've seen that question show up in a couple of them. Um, whether or not dissolving them in the different reagents is an endo or an exothermic process, and then things like conductivity, just make sure that they're familiar with the language of science so that they are propped up for success. Then also, no observation is too small. So you know, one question I've seen on exams, which I thought was actually kind of tricky was, you know, is your unknown substance more or less dense than water? And the observation that would correspond to that is when you drop it in water to dissolve it, it sinks to the bottom. So, you know, an observation like dropped it in the beaker, it sank to the bottom is something that they might not think to write, but, you know, they would only get partial credit if they didn't have a specific observation that corresponded to that um, exam question. Even though if they did know it was denser than water, they get some credit. If they didn't have that observation, they couldn't get full credit. Let's see, I have all on that one. I don't know if I have any other. No, nope, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's. I think that's sort of the interesting part about this event and why it's different than a lot of science sort of teaching in general is, yeah, I mean, it's just about writing down as much as you can. Nothing is too trivial. And then if you make an inference, you're doing something wrong. So, you know, which is very, it's not typically how I think about teaching, but I think that's kind of a, an interesting approach to getting them familiar with sort of the process of being in the lab, because that's really all you can trust is what you've observed. So, so do you take points off if they write an inference on the, ob on the observation sheet? If they have the observation indicated and the observation written, then... For their answer or just on the paper, the original observation? On the observation sheet, if they have the observation and the inference, I didn't see it. You know, I'm not going to take points off for something that's written on their observation sheet that they don't specifically point to. If they have on the exam, they say observation one and I go to observation one and it's just an inference and they say the solution is basic and not, you know, a gas formed whenever I added it to hydrofluoric acid. Um, or the substance is basic, sorry. If they wrote, if it's just an inference where they've called it an observation, then they would lose points in that case. They wouldn't get zero points, but they would lose some. Um, yeah, I didn't have any close scores. I can't say that that will never happen. But I feel like I didn't have any really, really poor scores either. I think most of them did really well on this and tended to, they did better than I thought they would. Um, and some of them got some of the tricky ones. Let's see. So that website, which I can, I just do it from here. I can pull up quickly. Let me see if I can, do I have it up here? I do. So the website that I keep referring to is this one. 
So I got here, let me share the screen. I got here by literally Googling can't judge a powder science Olympiad. I think it was the first thing that came up. Um, so when I'm talking about this recommended equipment list, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, and then um, they have some stuff about the Texas Instruments. I didn't have anybody bring in like a graphing calculator with probes. I think that's a little extra for this specific event. Yeah, and I think, yeah, the resources probably aren't there to provide everybody with one of those. Um, and then here are the practice tests. Like I said, these are great. Uh, I think this is the one I was looking at earlier. Uh, stop it. Stop that, you. Yeah, so the, I mean, theirs is very similar. Their rhetoric to perform as many relevant tests as possible in 30 minutes. Um, they specify that it's a household chemical and then they give students a little bit more than what is necessary. So they were given magnesium sulfate and sodium chloride. Um, in this case, if you were given extra solid reagents, or not, these aren't solid, these are liquids. So these are solutions of unknown molarity. Um, then you would do the same thing as you would with the sodium hydroxide and the hydro, uh, hydrochloric acid, where they would also try and mix it with these two solutions, um, take conductivity of these two beforehand, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so this is, yeah, so this is an example of one of the tests, um, soluble in water. See, this is actually like they would have to point to their observation. They don't give an actual uh, point breakdown. Let me see if I have. Where is that one? Maybe it was UT Austin. Let's see, what, where was it? Yeah, so this one just said, does the solution of this unknown substance perform a precipitate when mixed with this ma uh, magnesium sulfate? Um, so essentially, if they added it, something would fall out. They would write down formed white powder or something and then note that observation. Maybe this was the one. Yeah, so in this one, sometimes they give this for the students in the actual introductions. I don't think I gave this information, and most of them don't. The difference between observation and inference, just to throw them a bone. Um, and then this is how other supervisors sort of outline their grading. I don't think I have my exam on here. Maybe I do in my drive somewhere. Um, but yeah, is the substance crystal or amorphous? Substance has small crystals with the or observation sort of indicated substances, crystal and powder, that's an inference. So they'll still get points. Um, if it's inaccurate, then zero points for either of those things. So that's kind of, we have lots of these practice exams and they all have keys. So if you, you know, want to find common questions um, for that or for those, then that's a great place to look. And I think that is everything on this website. And then there's also just, you know, in case, no, okay, well, yeah, we'll keep sharing this just for whatever, if in case um, you're interested in what sort of materials we are looking at whenever we're writing this exam, what's told to us, you can go to the event supervisors page and find event specific information here. Um, so all of that is available online, sort of the instructions I'm given for how to write this exam, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you guys have plenty of things to do with your time other than look at this website, no. but just in case, um, that is there for you. And then finally, thank you for teaching all the kids because I've had plenty of really great undergrad students who their interest in science started when they were youngins. And it's really cool that we have enthusiastic leaders in the community. But is there any, I, I'm a couple minutes over time, but do you guys have any questions for me? Yes. Yeah, we give them paper. Um, I've mostly seen just plain white paper. I've not seen any lined paper, but sometimes, you know, it's like the event supervisors have to provide it. So sometimes somebody will slap a word table in and just, you know, make really broad lines. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's more a wise one would, because that's more for your own benefit as somebody who has to grade. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I know that a lot of, I can't write in a straight line without paper or without lines. So I'm sure uh, middle schoolers have a hard time as well. But yeah. Yeah, we have to provide it just, I don't, you know, I guess just for, just in case, to be safe. Yeah, 
So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you have any anything you think? Yeah. There might be. Oh, no problem. Thank you guys for participating. Oh, okay. That may be. I, yeah, I think that's just, yeah, somebody's not added. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys for participating. I wasn't sure. I'm glad that we took the whole time. You know, that down or out to your next place, the next room that we're going to be 